if people have one experience with your brand, that kind of romantic experience with your brand before they purchase from you, and then they have a totally different experience with your brand when they have a problem, it just creates friction and friction creates more contacts to the contact center. So if you sound fun and sexy before the customer buys, and if you sound like a white-wigged barrister from the turn of the century after they buy, we're just going to get more emails into the contact center, more phone calls, more tweets, more all of it. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Warsaw, Poland. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week, I'm talking with Leslie Oflehaven. Leslie's a get-to-the-point writer and a writing instructor. She's the owner and founder of eWrite, where she helps Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations learn how to write better for both their customers and their internal audiences too. Now, if you've followed me for a while, then you know that one of the key behaviors that go into simple experiences is to lose the jargon. And Leslie is one of the best people to talk to around that, as she's an expert on using plain language in customer experience and in the workplace. And here's what happens when you make plain language a staple in your customer and employee experience. You increase your customer satisfaction ratings, you reduce your training cycles, you improve employee productivity, and you limit your legal risk. Wow, that's a lot of benefit just from using simple and plain language. So here it is. Here's my interview with Leslie Oflehaven. Hi, Leslie. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to join you today. Yes, well... I'm happy you're here. I know we've talked about this for, I think, a couple months. And so I'm, I'm glad we're finally able to get you here on the show. I've been following you online for a while, and I love all of your lessons around writing and communication and specifically around plain language. Cool, cool. Well, I, I love it that you've been following me. I've been following you, and I feel that if we were sitting down in person, we might be having one of those conversations. We're like, yes, I agree. Yes, I agree. But let's not do that on the podcast. I don't think that makes for a great podcast. No, it's all right. Well, it, it, at least we can recognize we both are part of the Mutual Appreciation Society. <laughs> of who? <laughs> yes. Well, first things first, I want to hear more about your story. So tell me a bit about your story how you got into customer experience and specifically your focus on writing for customers. Sure. I've owned my own writing training consultancy for 27 years. This, In fact, this month is my 27th anniversary. And even before that, in my professional life, I have been a writing teacher all my life. And I launched this business, eWrite, in the late 90s when it was clear people who had never written web content before were going to have to write it. And, and if we remember back to those days, many companies were copying the, co the copy from a six panel brochure and publishing his web content. And it was a hellscape online. But my mission has always been to help people learn to write well at work. And just around 2000, I started, I and everyone else started to realize that Many people who had been answering 1-800 phone calls in contact centers now were writing email. And, you know, even though it didn't take hold, they were also writing live chat in the early aughts. It didn't right. take hold back then. And I am, I am committed to helping people build the writing skills they need at work. I, this is my life's work, my day's work, both. And so I thought these are some distressed writers, these frontline customer service agents, these are some put upon people they thought their job was going to be on the phone. So that's how I got interested. And it's been almost 23 years where I've been supporting companies to help their frontline teams write better email, chat, social media, text, chatbot content, and whatever else is coming down the line. So in that time, 
how have you seen writing evolve and, or rather, has it evolved or devolved? Yes. Well, actually, I'll take the second part first. I don't think it's devolved. And I don't, I, as a person, and especially as a writing training consultant, I don't take that position like, darling, the kids these days can't write and no one can write. I don't think that way. And I don't believe that. Texting is real writing. It's as real as any other kind of writing. So it hasn't devolved. No, it hasn't devolved. The writing, the way writing has changed is that the forms and the tools we use, the forms we write in and the tools we use to write have changed in extraordinary ways. And here you and I are, Matt, in the five minutes before producing written language changes forever. We're in the period where about eh, one third of our friends and four tenths of our colleagues are using ChatGPT or another tool to generate language. And a year from now, those percentages will be a lot higher. We, You and I will remember today, it's the five minutes before the revolution. Yeah. And I think of this as similar to that time 20-ish years ago when the internet was really gaining speed and people were trying to figure out how to work in that environment whether it was writing, whether it was research, whether it was all the different tools for their job. Yes, it, though the revolution is more profound now because um, we were packaging content or writing that we had done in the old way for new publication platforms 25 years ago. Now we're producing writing in a different way. We're generating it in a different way. And uh, that that is a bigger revolution. But back to the changes I've seen uh, over my many years in business. Again, as I said, it's the forms we use to publish in. We When you write, if you work for a county government and you write the text that says the highway is shut down because a tractor trailer overturned, that's business writing. And it may be 160 characters or less, but that's business writing. And those forms are new. And the tools are. They are. I want to talk about writing as it relates to customer experience. And I've heard you talk about customer experience being like a romantic relationship. Explain that to me. The experience a customer has with a brand is often beyond rational, you know, just like love is. And I'll speak for myself. I am in a a committed love relationship with Southwest Airlines, and they disappoint me on the regular, but I just can't quit them. I oh, can't wow. quit them. So there, there are some irrational affiliation feelings customers have with their brands. And I think you and I both know that when customers tolerate or endure uh, bad customer experiences, that is a kind of a form of love. It's a commitment that goes beyond the facts of the relationship. And here's a, an example I recently had. I needed to make an appointment with a physician's office. And, and when I messaged them inside their portal, and for our next podcast, let's talk about how we hate doctor's office portals. But oh my goodness. inside the portal, I had to use a drop down, And all the choices in the drop down, all the menu choices is little scraps of UX writing. All the menu choices were irrelevant to me. They were highly relevant to the business practices of the doctor's office. Like uh, one of the choices was clinical. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it's clinical. I have no idea. What does that you know? mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, But did I stop seeing that doctor? No. And did I call in? No. Just like every other brat, I chose other from the drop down and I sent my message. And this is a kind of a romantic relationship. We form a commitment with the company and sadly, many times the customer absorbs the flaws in the communication or the flaws in the experience. Mentioning Southwest Airlines, mentioning your doctor's office, I can see where sometimes we stay with a brand, we stay with a company because we're tolerating them. We tolerate them maybe until something really better comes along. On the other side, there are some where when we do get a 
less than desirable experience, it's okay because we have such a strong affinity for them already. It's already been built up, I guess. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to make sure that we're building up that affinity with our customers? I'm going to always bring it around to writing to customers in plain language. That's my, that's my answer for almost every question. But when we choose and do the work involved in using candid, understandable, living, good, communicate customers, I think we beckon them to fall in love with us right away because plain language instills trust and it promotes understanding or compre- even comprehension comprehension. When we trust companies and we trust brands and when we understand what they're asking us to do or what they've told us to do to solve a problem, for example, our affiliation is really strong. And as you and I know, so many brands choose unplain language, overly fussy, loaded with jargon, um, sketchy with marketing BS, that when a brand really does communicate plainly, the effect is stunning and 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 uh, unique. I just wish that more brands would understand this and would understand the value of this. And I'm curious what drives a lot of this poor use in language. Well, the fear of legal risk drives a lot of obscure writing or bordering. Nah, it's not dishonest. I was going to say bordering on dishonest writing. It's just lack of candor. It's a writing posture where the writer's arms are crossed protectively off over their chest instead of kind of open, like, let me tell you what I really mean. And the fear of legal risk does that. And also, we're kind of bred to write a certain way, especially in the workplace as well as in school. But we, we're fed on a diet of a certain type of writing. And much of what we read in the corporate world, the government world, isn't very plain. And we produce what we read, you know, (laughs) we take it in and we put it out. And I think that's between the fear of legal risk, the habits of producing businessy, not very candid writing. And in the community, in my community, the community of frontline customer service workers, a lack of authority to write candidly. This this is another reason they don't write very plainly. They use wording like, as per your previous request, we regret to inform you that, which is just Rococo. You know, yeah. it's just too elaborate. But why do they do that? Because they're scored on every keystroke they make. The person scoring them may not be a plain language writer. And they, there's no incentive for them as individual employees to step out of the lane. So they don't. A lot of that has been, uh, whether it's in guidelines or templates, it's been pre-scripted for them. When this happens, you say these phrases and these statements. In one point in my career, my team was responsible for a certain area of the company And if any customers wrote in to our president or into the C-suite with a complaint letter, and it was about this specific area, then those letters were routed to my team to respond. Well, legal always had to approve those letters and approve those communications. And we wanted to say certain things, but legal said, no, you had to say it this way. Per our procedures, we, we regret any convenience this may have caused you. Right, I, right. I knew it caused them an inconvenience because that's why they wrote about it. Right, right. And that is that is the outsized fear of legal risk. And also, if everybody at work were a type of horse, the attorneys are the thoroughbreds and the people who work in the contact center or even in the executive office answering complaints, they're kind of, you know, the strong horse, maybe not the the one that pulls the wagon. They're not the thoroughbreds and the thoroughbreds throw their intellectual weight around and they say it's too legally risky to imply that there was even an inconvenience. That's simply not true. That is just not true. It's a type of corporate browbeating or legalistic browbeating and good companies push back against that. Good companies push back against that. You know, I've worked with pharmaceutical manufacturers and someone says, Someone writes in and says, uh, I took your headache tablet 
and I got a rash. Well, of course, the legal risk there is very high. If we respond, oh no, our headache tablets caused a rash. Now we're you know off the charts on legal risk. But we can say a rash, that sounds really uncomfortable, especially when you had a headache too. <laughs> Express yeah. empathy. We didn't increase our legal risk. There's no legal risk at agreeing that rashes are uncomfortable. So don't be ridiculous. If we weigh the two uh, uh, approaches, building empathy is far more efficient. It's morally higher ground than being afraid of legal risk that isn't there. We've been talking really around customer service issues and communicating around those. A lot of times it's our frontline customer support agents who are doing this communicating. So what can we do to empower that front line to use plain language, speak in the right brand voice that is behind the brand that they re represent while still doing all of these other things? Well, I'll take the two parts of that question in reverse order. One thing we must do is make sure that the brand voice guidance that the marketing team uses, that the agency uses, the PR folks, all of them, they have brand voice guidance. There's a document somewhere and it probably has the color palette for the logo. But in addition to that, it probably has substantial uh, advice about how to use words to sustain our brand. And I cannot tell you the, the percentage of companies I work with where the customer facing writers and their leadership have never seen that brand voice guidance is probably about 85 or 90 percent. So if all the fabulous people in marketing with their fabulous glasses and their little ironic sub stash or whatever facial hair they're wearing, <laughs> if they're using that brand voice guide, all of these strong cart pulling horses, they need to use it too. They need to have seen it. They need to be familiar with all of the writing practices. And in my work, they usually need extra chapters in the brand voice guide or extra section that apply directly to their work. Yeah. So, well, so that's the first thing. Like use the same tool. We don't have HR well, doesn't doesn't HR doesn't bail on the context center, you know. Use the same tool. That's the first thing. And when it comes to brand guidelines, in, in their defense, I think a lot of times they'll create these guidelines when they think that it's from the brand that's doing the communicating. So when it comes to advertising, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to the primary social media channels, when it comes to the external communications and PR, speaking from the brand. But at the same time, every frontline team member, every frontline employee is representing the brand. Like, like that's mm -hmm. just one more mouthpiece of the brand. And so honestly, allowing them the guidelines and working with them, collaborating with them to show them how to instill the brand guidelines into their role, into what they're doing, that actually empowers them even more. It's essential because the people who use the brand guidelines who do not work in customer service are far more in control of their workday and their products. Customer service is a reactive role. So, yes. you know, let's say we launch version 6.3 of the software and there's a glitch in it. Now the contact center is slammed and they have to react. And we want them to react in the brand voice for a very practical reason. If people have one experience with your brand, that kind of romantic experience with your brand before they purchase from you, and then they have a totally different experience with your brand when they have a problem. It just creates friction and friction creates more contacts to the contact center. So if you sound fun and sexy before the customer buys, and if you sound like a white wigged barrister from the turn of the century after they buy, we're just going to get more emails into the contact center, more phone calls, more tweets, more all of it. So we don't want that. So you have to teach the people and prepare the people who answer customer inquiries all day to use the brand voice. But of course, we have, you know, a natural selection issue here. Those people did not come to their work with that kind of 
verbal wordplay facility and funness that the people in marketing have. It's just not a, a, a trait that we hire for in the contact center, but OMG, they need it. They totally need that words, that love of wordsmithing, wordsmithing toward the brand. And I think it can be taught. I think Indeed. it can be taught and, and trained into what they do. Absolutely. This is a core this m- principle of my work is that people can acquire the writing skills they need on the job, even when those writing skills change, when their work changes. People can, but we mustn't expect them to do it without training and other kinds of support. And people, you and I don't write in a production environment. You know, people work in contact centers like the chick in the Rumpelstiltskin store. They're like, hey, go in the closet and make the straw into gold. And when you're done, you can come out. That's how it is, you know. Turn this incoming hysteria from the customers into thoughtful responses that protect and sustain our brand. They're going to need some training. And to me, that seems like a very, that, that seems like in, even more important to give them the tools to be able to understand, okay, here's how you use the brand voice. Here's how you use plain language. Here's how you use empathy. Because they're having to do it on the fly. They're not working over a period of weeks or sometimes even months where they'll craft something and say, oh, this, this looks good. Okay, hey, reviewers, what do you think? And then the reviewers say, well, th- overall, it's great, but let's change this and change this and change this. You don't have time for all that. It's all real time in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So how can we help them? Well, one yeah. thing we can do is write any pre-written content templates or macros, whatever you want to can it, c- call them, or knowledge-based articles. How can we write? We should be writing those in the brand voice. And we should not use a marketing team to write those uh, canned answers. We should use a well-equipped customer service person, a well-equipped, I mean, a nimble writer to write those. And we should hire so that we can maintain the library of canned answers. Because, you know, you don't like plant your garden once and then step away for six weeks and come back and go, weeds? No one told me about weeds. How that happened? Yeah. We give them, we need to give them pre-written content that is written in the brand voice. And then we need to protect them. We need to insulate them and push uh, from the pressure from the attorneys to reduce legal risk. I'm not saying they should incur legal risk. That's not, I'm not, you know, I'm not stupid. I'm not saying that, but we need to protect them from an outsized fear of legal risk. Because what happens if you're an hourly worker, frontline customer service agent, and you actually thought you're going to do your job on your phone is you don't have to hear it twice from a lawyer never apologize. It'll increase our legal risk. You hear that once and you're done. You are done. So if we're never apologizing, we're definitely never empathizing. And now we have some pretty crappy customer service responses. We've both mentioned legal risk a handful of times. And from my experience, from what I've seen, from what, what I've talked to with other corporate attorneys, a lot of times most of them want to operate from the level of zero risk, having no legal risk at all. But it's just kind of like um, like anything else where there's any level of risk, whether it's investing for your retirement or any anything else. There's always got to be some give and take and to understand here is the situation where we're okay with an amount of risk. And then based on that situation, Here's the level of risk that we're okay with. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's uh, a truth of life, what you've just expressed. There is some risk involved in all times. And there's never as much risk in the construction of these customer service responses as the attorneys fear there is. So again, you know, back to I took your headache tablets and I got a rash. We can empathize with having a headache. (laughs) We can empathize with having a rash. There is no legal risk with empathizing with either one of those. And if those are too scary, the the frontline customer service agent can be 
trained and practiced in empathizing with the urge to let us know there's no legal risk there either. I can definitely understand why you tweeted this to us today and I want to learn more. That's a, that's a, you know, kind of a lukewarm empathy, but it's still empathy and there isn't any legal risk. I can definitely understand why you wanted to let us know. Yeah. So, so there's, I, I just gave three options in a genuinely risky situation. There's three things we can write that aren't risky. <laughs> there you go. Well, when it comes to empathy, and we've talked about empowering agents with templates and with scripts. So I'm curious, can you script empathy? Should empathy yes. be scripted? Or what's the ideal way to instill empathy into those reactions? This is Matt, this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, about oh. a year ago, I led a panel discussion on this at, the, at an ICMI conference. I'm going to give you my short answer as we have discussed. Yes, for frontline customer service workers, I believe empathy can be scripted. I do believe it. And I believe this because I have done this. I have seen it happen. And because I think it's immoral to call on frontline customer service agents who are complained at hundreds of times a day to access their own human empathy And to use that capacity for empathy in every single interaction. So from my human empathy, let's say you told me that one a loved one was ill. From my human empathy, I, Leslie, I'm going to react to you, Matt, in with my actual human capacity for empathy. But if you if I work for a software company and everyone is hating on me because the new version of the software uh, is slower to load. Um, I don't think it's fair for the, the company to ask those frontline agents to access their human empathy. I think this is a job skill. And we give them the language they need to express empathy as a job skill. Now, we also want them to have the writing skill to free text, to substitute the pre, a different expression of empathy for the pre-written one when the situation calls for it. But we don't expect um, every funeral home director to be sobbing in a handkerchief in their office when our loved one dies. But we do expect them to say, I'm so sorry for your loss. I want to make today go extremely smoothly for you because I know you have many people visiting from out of town. That is professional expressions of empathy. And that is all we owe at our job. And for frontline customer service agents, that is a matter of canned empathy language that they deploy in a sincere sounding way. There, I said it. I have to be honest. I I don't think I've ever thought of it that deeply. And I haven't empathized with the customer service agent's role, recognizing that they're being bombarded by so many calls and Rarely does somebody call customer service for a positive reason. Rarely do they call customer service to thank them for the great experience they just had. They call for negative reasons. And so because of that, if you're asking customer service agents to uh, to only provide empathy from their own self without any sort of canned responses, that can be taxing and exhausting. Yes. And I believe as employers, we're not actually entitled to that portion of a person's emotional makeup. But I don't want them to see, I, I'm not saying that they're keyboarding while they eye roll, you know, I understand why you're frustrated. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying they should use the same stock empathy phrasings each time. What I do strongly believe in what I teach is that We want frontline customer service writers to understand that empathy is practical. It helps customers trust you enough to allow them to allow you to help them. And it also helps customers uh, understand that you do see the the issue from their perspective so that together, uh, so that they can stop arguing that you don't understand their problem. This is practical. If you if you're going to answer someone's question or solve their problem, they need to believe 
that you understand and showing that you understand. We, we do that by expressing empathy. So this is a practical job skill that we want them to be able to use because it reduces repeat contacts. It shortens the time of individual contact. So a live chat will be shorter if the rep expresses empathy. A phone call will be shorter when the rep does that. I, I don't want anyone listening to think, dang, she's insincere. I'm not. And I don't want them to, I don't want frontline folks to come across as insincere, but I do want their employers to equip them with numerous reasonable things to write that will express empathy and the expectation that they will free text within these expressions of empathy. They'll add specifics from the actual situation they're dealing with. This morning, I was actually listening to a podcast. It was on a completely different subject, but with, uh, <clears throat> with using scripts and scripted language in the workplace. And one of the people on there was reminding us that a lot of times, like we love watching sitcoms on TV every week. And you need to remember that every one of those actors in that sitcom has a script. Mm -hmm. has a script that they've been trained and taught to read and memorize, and they're delivering on that script. And their performance is probably about 80% of that script. And then the other 20% is whatever it is about that actor or that character that makes that character special that allows them for their personality to kind of come forth while they're delivering that script. Indeed. And that's a great, that, what a great reminder. I, or what a great explanation. I will probably use that. We don't expect ad-libbing from right. people we watch on TV who charm us. We shouldn't expect it. And actually, that's, that's a good comparison, but we don't expect ad-libbing from customer service writers. We, it, it, we expect something harder. As a writing teacher, I can tell you, and a person who studied the cognition of composition, I can tell you that taking a canned answer, pre-written answer, and altering it enough to make it uh, relevant to the person who's receiving it is a higher level writing skill than writing the response from scratch. It's like go. someone saying, um, here's a cookie. Can you make a waffle out of it for me? And you're like, probably there's flour, sugar, butter in both. I have to take it apart, you know. It's much harder writing skill. Yeah. So it's comes down to empathy and really empathizing with customer support and empathizing with the frontline team members and recognizing what all is included and what all is entailed in their role and then giving them the tools that really empower them to do that. Indeed. And then as my career goes on, what I'm seeing is Companies that do what you've just described and companies that do the opposite of what you've just described, they're, they're kind of pulling away from each other. The, the spectrum is growing wider and wider. There aren't, what I'm seeing is more rigid, failed communication from companies on one end of the spectrum and more wonderful responsive, authentic, and uh, effective communication from companies on the other end of the spectrum. And part of the reason I think this is happening is because um, when companies provide service in numerous channels, as time has gone on, the best of them provide uh, service across those channels as the customer needs it. Well, it started as an email, but what I realize is that you need a video you need me to make you a little 30 second video that shows how to operate the software, for example, or well, shows how to repair the window unit and the air conditioner. I'm going to make this little video for you. So yes, I'm responding by email, but the service is actually in video. Or I've gotten an email from you. Can I just call you? Or well, we're in live chat, but I want to switch to email because I want to make sure that I can provide a document for you that's easier to read as as documentation or as a tool for the future. And when frontline teams are allowed to encourage to switch channels like that, probably the quality of their communication is also really high because there's so much nimbleness and so much trust 
in allowing frontline and encouraging frontline folks to switch channels as the customer needs, that the authority, the freedom from <laughs> punishing QA forms, um, <laughs> all of that is also in place too. So the great ones are just getting greater. What does the customer relationship look like at both of those ends of the spectrum? What's the customer relationship look like with those that are doing it really well, that are, that are, that are doing it great and that are nimble enough and empowered enough versus those that are so rigid? It's the difference between going to for retail shopping at REI, which is something I've always enjoyed. You know, I always spend more than I thought I would, but I've always enjoyed and going to your state's Department of Motor Vehicles. You, you may have to do both in one weekend. You know, you need some new hiking boots. You're going to go to REI, but you don't go there loaded for a fight. You're not locked and loaded as you walk through the door. When you go to the DMV, you are. You know, you've cleared your calendar. You're sure that it's going to be a terrible experience. You maybe participate unwillingly. You're confused, but, you know, we'll still participate. Customers will still hang in there with companies, especially the DMV, where you have to go there. That's the only place you can buy what you need. We have those companies in retail settings, too. There's only one place you can buy what you need. It's just, uh, I think the big difference is how much friction the customer themselves causes. Yeah, You know, in companies where the customer trusts that the communication will be candid, will be flexible, as I was describing earlier, the customer doesn't cause friction. In companies where they don't trust it, the customer can cause the friction in the form of repeat contacts, of not accepting answers, especially not taking no as an answer, of escalating. These are all behaviors that frustrated customers uh, 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 employ more. And I guess if I were to talk to any sort of business owner, any sort of brand leader that was in that situation where they know that they have these rigid systems and they're not providing this great and nimble and empathetic experience and say, you'll be okay so long as you are the only option that your customer has to go to. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. That's your situation. Ooh, that is cold, but true. Cold, yeah. but true. <laughs> That's it. Well, Leslie, I have really enjoyed this and I appreciate you answering my questions, but I've got one last question for you. If you were to create a five song soundtrack around your work, what songs would you include? All right. I'm pulling up my list right now and I'm going to tell you my five song list. You are asking a question I was so happy to answer. And then just oh. before we started, you showed me the LP of uh, <laughs> one of my favorite artist, Tom Waits, and yeah. a song you and I both love. So here is my list of five songs. And they are there. I, I have to admit, they're probably loosely related to being a soundtrack for my work. So the first one is a 2022 song that Bonnie Raitt wrote and won a Grammy for. And then the Grammy broadcast, everybody's like, hey, who's that old lady? And I oh, said, man. that old lady is my heart. This yeah. is a song, her uh, new song called Just Like That. I absolutely love this song. It's the, about the person who received a donor heart meeting the mother of the person whose heart was donated to save the other person's life. We have the Kleenex nearby. Yeah. It is a sweet, sweet song. And then in honor of Tina Turner, who passed yesterday, River Deep Mountain High, just the, the absolute joy in that song and the striving. I really like the striving. So the first song touches our emotions, which we need to do this work. The second is about striving and uh, going to the ends of the earth. The third one tied to the whipping cost by the Allman Brothers. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain why I chose that one, because sometimes we feel like we've been tied to the whipping post. Um, I did propose, propose that for our first dance at our wedding, but my husband did not think that was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, I chose uh, number four, Looking for the Heart of Saturday Night by Tom Waits, the song that you and I both love. And, and I actually chose yeah. that as a word lover, just to picture the moment, the feeling, the, the poetry in that song. So 
if we're celebrating the power of words, I had to pick that one. And then the last one, Little Feet, I would listen to Lloyd George say anything to me, but I really like Rolla Measy because it, well, it's a love song and it's a connection song. And I thought, uh, let's celebrate that and celebrate what ties us together. So that's my list. I love that list. And like I shared earlier, here's, here's my proof, my vinyl copy of The Heart of Saturday Night to show you that, yes, I, I too am a Tom Waits fan. And yeah. that is my <laughs> favorite album of his. We never knew this about each other. And yet now we know how we'll... We, we, I, when I was a kid, I used to call my friends. We watched TV while we were both on the phone back in the day. So you and oh, I can wow. call each other, listen to the album. Yes, I'd love that. I'd love that. <laughs> well, Leslie, I have learned so much from you from all your lessons and learned so much from our discussion today. But where can people go to learn more? Well, you can always connect with me at my website, which is eWriteOnline.com. I'm active on LinkedIn now that I have had to break up with Twitter for political reasons, come on over to LinkedIn. So I would love to join you there. I'm a LinkedIn learning author of six writing courses. So if you want to take a few courses, you know, you can always get those courses free through your public library account. If you log on to your public library account, you can take any LinkedIn learning course. So join me over there. And, And monthly, I do a LinkedIn live broadcast with my colleague, Professor Kim Saito Campbell. It's called Fix This Writing, How Two Experts Make Bad Writing Better. So come join with that. (laughs) There you go. So active lessons to learn right there. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. I'm so grateful for your time. It's absolutely been my pleasure. Thank you for your sharp questions and your open mind. I loved it. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Leslie Oflehaven. You can learn more from her at eWriteOnline.com. And go and follow her on LinkedIn, where you can watch her monthly LinkedIn live events, where she helps professionals, just like you, harness the power of plain language in your work. And if you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead, hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Howard Tiersky. We'll be talking all about lessons from his book, Winning Digital Customers, The Antidote to Irrelevance. If you want to learn how to stay relevant to today's customers, then you need to learn how to deliver a seamless digital experience. And that's exactly what Howard and I discuss. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Howard's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Simple.